uh, thanks for joining us uh, at our nth uh, COVID conversation. I, I forgot to add them up, but we, uh, we're now at several dozen, if not more, of these conversations and webinars that we've been hosting since June of uh, 2020. And we're still going because, as many of you recognize, uh, COVID is still a significant hazard um, in our communities and especially in our workplaces and especially since uh, precautions have been reduced. So this is a, a bit of an anniversary session since uh, we had Tara visit us uh, last year uh, when, when the precautions were first dropped and we were uh, guarded and anxious about it then. And so now this is uh, one year in review to understand the impact on workplaces. And, uh, and then it's still, we're still trying to figure out ways we can make a difference um, within the paradigm that we're in. So we're going to start with my colleague, John Audick, who's the occupational hygienist from uh, the Hamilton Clinic in Ocow. He has been with, uh, with Ocow for almost 34 years. I think at the beginning of May will be his 34th anniversary. And he also, we're proud to say, just recently won uh, the Q Nelson Excellence in Occupational Hygiene Award from the Occupational Hygiene Association of Ontario, which is uh, well-earned recognition. So he's been following the data um, on COVID and on SARS-CoV-2, um, as well as in the past on uh, SARS-1 and H5N1 and, and other pandemics. And so he's going to uh, set the stage and then we'll hear from Tara to understand a more national perspective. So. Uh, Thanks for joining us. And John, you want to turn on your slides? Okay, thank you. Well, thanks for uh, dropping in in, in this discussion. I'm going to start with a little bit of background. Um, I started looking at the numbers actually in January and February of 2020 when I was looking at the uh, Chinese data and uh, I noticed that it was uh, following uh, a perfect curve and I was wondering uh, the coefficient of uh, variation, the R squared, was almost uh, perfectly one and uh, so I was, I was curious already then. And so, um, anyway, once uh, we got started, uh, very early, um, probably in June, I think, of 2020, I was sitting around the table with my daughter, who's quite a whiz at uh, coding, and I said, all, all this data is there, but it's not in a format that we can use it. Uh, and then, so I said, I told her what I wanted at the supper table and by nine o'clock that night she had something together and uh, so our idea was we wanted people, uh, it came from, you know, when you're at the beach there's a flag that tells you uh, what the water conditions are, a red flag means stay out of the water, and green flags, it's, it's good to go swimming. So we thought, is there something that we can provide uh, workers um, for their region? We have uh, some tips that we included on uh, at that time. This is 2020, so it was communicating, cleaning, hand washing, ventilating, distancing, screening, and masking. But we wanted uh, to have a regional risk. We have 34 public health units, or is it 32? I forget. Um, in Ontario, and um, I'm getting requests. I don't know what that means. How do I turn this off? Just keep going. That could be you if you moved your mouse. No. Okay. Somehow an ant. Okay. Let's see. There we go. And we looked at the public health uh, Ontario's criteria and translated it into a 14 day per 10,000 people. Um, Right now, it's weekly per 100,000, so uh, we picked the wrong scale, but uh, we, we paralleled their scale. And we came up with these um, graphs that showed uh, the infection rates for different areas. 
and we graded them according to those colors I just showed. And uh, you can see here by the time we got to um, uh, May of 2021, we were almost always in the red. And uh, we also provided a table for each uh, public health unit uh, with their category and also the, the Ontario categories. And our categories were, uh, if you translate them into the uh, weekly per 100,000, were fairly close to the Ontario ones at that time. And here's one uh, that was in a, a quieter time, the summer of 2021, when things uh, cooled down a bit. And we also uh, told people that you could find your public health unit and click on it on the graph and see it and note the color band and then go to the color band to find your seven key uh, COVID tip uh, topics. And then uh, on each of these uh, seven items. And so uh, for each item for communicating, making sure everybody understands what's going on. Uh, for instance, uh, TTC for a while had a, a, a website where they explained um, how many TTC employees had tested positive and actually uh, where they worked and what job they did. And uh, TTC at this point was slightly higher than the uh, Toronto rate. Then cleaning and disinfecting. Uh, this was a time when we were uh, wiping down our groceries with uh, bleach before we uh, took them in the house and there was we had the list of disinfectants from Health Canada that were approved. It turns out that uh, soap and water and elbow grease was probably uh, sufficient and a lot of those dangerous chemicals that people were fogging weren't needed. Hand washing, um, again the dogma back then was that it was a droplet and therefore contact transmission was a possibility. However, that wasn't, uh, didn't turn out to be as important as we thought back then. And ventilating, uh, again, we already uh, used 800 parts per million of carbon dioxide as our criteria back then and recommended MERV 13 or better filters. Uh, we also put together a ventilation calculation tool for, uh, was originally designed for classrooms, but also works for small meeting rooms and offices. And we also had a ventilation checklist, a uh, checklist that health and safety committee people could go through to uh, figure out if their ventilation system was up to recommendations. Distancing, uh, it was interesting, I found this um, by the way, it wasn't H5N1, it was H1N1 in, in 2009. Uh, we're, we're crossing our fingers about H5N1, about the bird flu now, but the three foot rule uh, back in 1920, uh, during the, uh, the Spanish flu uh, in barracks, they calculated the infection rate based on how far the beds were apart. And they went from nine inches to one foot, uh, to one foot four, to foot six and then three foot, uh, it was under 2% and that was considered acceptable uh, infection rate. And therefore that, uh, that's one of the suggestions of where the uh, three foot rule came from. Screening, tracking and risk assessment. Uh, well, this is fairly lengthy. Uh, but uh, the one that got the most focus uh, and questions was the face covering and masking. And at that time, what we were saying is that if your levels was low in the minimal risk thing, then it was symbolic, a token of solidarity. It's kind of ironic because now it's become symbolic in the opposite direction. Uh, then when you needed to control risk, it's uh, not a high risk yet, but uh, it's practice getting ready in case things get worse and then at some risk uh, or wider risk it's good etiquette it's good manners to keep your emissions to yourself however if you're in the danger zone uh, the red high risk uh, it's protection and et etiquette and uh, back then we we had these notices that when you went into a healthcare facility uh, you had to take off your 
N95 and put on one of these blue tissues with strings on, attached to them. And uh, unfortunately, uh, that happened to me just uh, two weeks ago again. I came in wearing an N95, which is fit tested, and I was given this nice little blue piece. Uh, we put together this this diagram to try to get across to people the difference between uh, the different masks. And you can see here an N95, whether it's fit tested or not, is far superior if uh, as long as the fit is right. So we had the big seven, uh, and it was based roughly on the hierarchy of controls. But what we noticed is that uh, it wasn't a hierarchy anymore. You needed all the layers, and you needed them together because not a single layer, whether vaccinations, ventilation, or what, could do everything. We needed as many protections uh, in each category as possible. We also watched the uh, StatsCan data, um, and originally we looked at the percentage of, or the proportion of healthcare workers who made up uh, the infections in the ages 20 to 59. And you can see at the beginning in April of uh, 2020, in, in uh, uh, Quebec, uh, it was up to 65% of the positive cases were healthcare workers. Uh, this was also the experience in China. The first people, be, at first they didn't think it was human to human transmission and it was because uh, nurses were getting sick that uh, they accepted the fact that it was being transmitted between humans. Then we watched the data. However, uh, as the data went on, uh, we noticed something uh, especially missing data. Quebec was very good. It was uh, very few uh, records had missing occupation data. But if you look at Ontario, uh, 91, 92% of, of uh, the variables were missing, uh, had missing data for, for that variable. Also with the WSAB, they were very good uh, for a while in reporting the number of uh, claims allowed. Uh, however, all of a sudden it was taken down in the summer of 2020. And uh, now we have a difficult time getting that data. And the new policy that uh, WSIB has just proposed uh, defines community acquired communicable illness as anything uh, if it's in the community, then it's not considered work-related, even if a worker uh, got the infection at work. And what this does is not recognizing um, the workplace as a place of infection and, and, and recognizing these infections as work-related actually uh, will have the effect of not incentivizing any control and thus the community acquired uh, diseases will spread at work because people don't have sick days or uh, they can't take the time off or they have workloads that don't allow them uh, to be absent from work uh, very long. And if there's no flexibility about working at home. So uh, we took down that, that website in uh, the summer of uh, 2022 uh, because the data was getting so unreliable. It was based on daily data and then they went to uh, weekly data and there was, it, it just became impossible uh, to track. So what uh, I put together now every week is uh, kind of a summary. Uh, this is a summary of the um, number of people who have uh, infection acquired uh, uh, antibodies or vaccine in, induced and right now, infection acquired is uh, at about 60 or 76 percent as of the middle of uh, February. And if you look back at October 2021, it was 3 percent and now it's 76 percent. You can see how it's grown over time. And the number of people with infection acquired antibodies in Canada is uh, well, well over 70 percent now. And then we have the recent counts. However, these are underestimates. Uh, 
some people say by five to ten times. And it's also interesting that the scale that uh, Public Health Ontario is using is quite different than the current scale that being used in the US. So right now we're um, recognizing uh, 23 infections per 100,000, which is in the blue uh, of the PHO scale, but it's in the yellow uh, of the uh, US scale. Uh, here we have recent cases. Again, these are underestimates. Uh, there could be 30,000 uh, recent deaths, uh, 30 in the previous week to last week. Uh, and weekly positivity is 9.9%. Uh, and one of the cutoffs that the PHO has is uh, if it's below 10%, then it's low. And so we just squeaked under it. We've been above that for a very long time. So COVID positivity is now considered low. Uh, and uh, however, if it was in the US, it would be in the orange category, which is interesting uh, why that such a big difference. I also looked at uh, the claim that this is no different than the flu. And I got some data for uh, flu deaths and hospitalizations up till 2017. After 2017, Ontario no longer reported uh, flu deaths. And uh, when you look at the worst of uh, the data, the levels uh, in 2021 to 2022 were five times the, the worst flu year for hospitalizations and 13 times uh, for deaths. Now, there's all kinds of reasons for that, and the numbers uh, may not be apples to apples, but uh, it gives you an idea. And if the positivity criteria, as I told you, is much different. For, for Ontario, anything less than 10% is green, uh, and our yellow is the same as their pink and red, and then we have a category that's uh, much higher uh, than the 15% uh, in the U.S. When it comes to hospitalizations, again, uh, this is actually fairly similar to the U.S. categories. If you look at hospital occupancy uh, to March 30th, I just downloaded these numbers a, a few minutes ago. Uh, we're finally heading into what the uh, science table labeled as their orange criteria. Uh, the science table doesn't exist anymore. And ICU uh, bed occupancy is also declining. And here we have deaths. And uh, we're, we're in the green according to the uh, Ontario category, but would be in the yellow if it was in the States. And still it's 30 people uh, a week in Ontario dying of COVID. Uh, and uh, we also followed the Statistics Canada all-cause mortality. And uh, you can see here the pink, the gray, and the dotted line are uh, 2020, 2021, and 2022. And it goes up to about October of last year. And you can see that those are much higher than uh, the others. Now, a lot of people think that's just old people, but when you look at uh, zero to 44, you can see that it's not just old people because in uh, 2014 to 2019, this was the range of uh, death rates, overall death rates. And for the uh, pandemic years that we have data for so far, it, it's higher. And, uh, you know, what was the worst year? And we all think back to 2020 that that was the worst year, but the number of deaths actually was the greatest in 2022. And we're not sure yet, uh, you know, we're only, if we multiply this uh, times uh, four, um, you know, uh, it looks like this year may not be as bad as last year. The death rate uh, per thousand infection, and again, we're counting infections in different categories, uh, but uh, it is uh, falling. And Ontario puts out uh, a weekly epidemiological point where they show the uh, case fatality ratio, which is the number of deaths per the number of cases. And this is for long-term care. So 
it's been a bit more consistent in testing than it is uh, in in the general population, obviously, uh, but uh, that is about to change, I think, June 1st. Uh, wave 1, 31.7% of those identified with uh, COVID uh, died, and now it's down to 2.9%, but it is higher than wave 6, which is uh, somewhat concerning, but Again, if you look at the fine print, they're changing the way they count things as they go. So the uh, influenza is always being compared. And uh, right now, influenza is quite low. And it's interesting, they're considering COVID as a uh, respiratory viral pathogen. And so they want to put it on just as another, any other. However, when they down this graph of the um, um, positivity, uh, they don't show COVID. Uh, you can see the spike in uh, influenza A that happened uh, this fall. And, but uh, so I always put the, uh, the data in there. Uh, so COVID right now is much higher than anything else. Um, although human, uh, metanumovirus is coming up, and uh, so is seasonal coronavirus. Uh, flu is much lower, although uh, we thought we got rid of flu influenza B, but uh, it's now more than influenza A. And again, if you look at the categories, uh, uh, this is this is an orange, but uh, for PHO, it's now green. The wastewater, uh, it's uh, tending up. I understand that uh, the funding for this uh, data may, may stop in June, and so we may not have uh, wastewater information. So what have we learned? Uh, well, the one thing we learned is there's lots of poor quality data around. Uh, the data keeps uh, changing, and uh, over time it seems to get worse, and it makes it difficult to keep up with it. The wastewater data is discontinued uh, instead of expanded because they could expand it for influenza and for a number of other uh, diseases. Uh, we will lose a major leading indicator. And if work-related infections aren't recognized as such, um, that should be aren't, <laughs> there will be no incentive for prevention. And so this all adds up if we're not careful, we'll end up where we were in March 2020. So this is uh, a bunch of amateur people fooling around with uh, data, but now I'd like to turn it over to Tara, who will, who's an epidemiologist and who knows this data a whole lot better. And so uh, take it away, Tara. Thank you. And uh, I'm not originally an epidemiologist by training. I'm um uh, originally a biochemist and biophysicist, um, although I've done a fair bit of, I'm an infectious disease researcher, so I've done a fair bit of epidemiology, um, but have sort of uh, uh, really ramped up those skills um, and uh, learned a lot to, to do some of the, um, the analysis and work that we need within Canada. Um, so, so today um, I'm going to talk a bit about, um, so uh, I lead um, an organization called COVID-19 Resources Canada and we've been around since the beginning of COVID. We were originally um, signing up volunteer scientists and uh, many of you signed up, likely signed up as volunteers to help with testing, contact tracing and then um, actually to get people out to long-term care homes and then um, at the height of um, the vaccine, we were um, doing a lot of vaccination outreach um, and we're just finishing uh, um, a grant from the Public Health Agency of Canada related to vaccination outreach. Um, but starting around January of, of uh, 2022, what we were finding was that, um, so we had a couple of different things we did for vaccination outreach. We did zoom meetings where anyone could join anonymously and ask um, volunteer scientists and healthcare providers we had a really large team ask them any questions they wanted about vaccines and we had a second thing we did um, which was to have um, 
sort of workshops to help people um, learn how to have um, conversations about difficult topics like vaccines um, with loved ones. But by January of 2022, we found that very few people were um, attending these sessions anymore, purely to ask um, questions about vaccines. But there clearly was a, still a need, and, and I and many of us were very concerned about um, the uh, sort of the way uh, communication about COVID changed when Omicron came. And um, so part of my background is I've done a lot of work on excess mortality in Canada during COVID. Um, so I knew that there would be a substantial amount of excess mortality in Canada, probably worse than in many other countries because we had controlled COVID fairly well compared to um, many countries before Omicron. So I was actually very concerned about that. Um, and I was really worried that people were not understanding the the um, the severity of the situation when you allow huge numbers of people to be infected, you know, where essentially, um, you know, as was just described, we went from less than 7% of the population infected to more recently over 70% in one year um, or about one year. So, um, so we, we didn't really know what to do. It was clear that there was still a need for support um, and we weren't sure what scientists or how how we could best support people. So we actually started asking um, in the, the Zoom sessions that we had and the first thing that the majority of people who um, attended told us was that they needed data, um, that they uh, needed to have information about what was happening to be able to make good decisions. So uh, around January of 2022 is when we started working on figuring out whether, um, first of all, figuring out how to um, de uh, determine, the, um, assess the quality of Canada's data, how accurate and complete it was in terms of um, a whole bunch of different outcomes, and whether we could um, generate uh, reasonable uh, models that would give us an idea of how many infections a day, we were seeing how many hospitalizations, how many severe outcomes we would expect from those, even trying to estimate, you know, how many long COVID cases we might be seeing um, as a result of, of um, estimated infection levels um, by province. And we started out, uh, you know, in the beginning, um, I was trying to, we were trying to model Ontario and Quebec and Quebec has excellent quality data. Um, Ontario really doesn't. Um, and so initially I was doing that, but it was very important to try to under, try to do this for every province in the country and, and um, territories. But, you know, for many places that was really challenging to do and became progressively more challenging as we got less and less information. And some provinces have been more forthcoming than others about providing data. And I would say that the only province that has done uh, a transparent and good job of this is Quebec. Um, Quebec reports publicly um, a lot of very valuable data and um, to the best of my knowledge, based on many conversations with colleagues um, working in the system as well as trying to um, verify the quality of the data compared to other parts of the world, um, Quebec uh, genuinely does seem to, to be very good at reporting and to not hold back um, a lot of what's reported. And uh, one of the things that I'm going to talk about today is, um, is how that is very much not true for many provinces, especially Ontario and the Atlantic provinces, where um, there has been really quite poor um, sh public sharing of, of um, full data sets. So, but Ultimately, so over time, in the course of these conversations that we have, which some of you have attended, some of you, uh, we still, we have Tuesdays we talk, Tuesday evenings we talk about COVID data, Thursdays we have an open session, Saturdays we plan our activities because we're, we've sort of shifted from uh, what was largely a group of scientists to um, now uh, just a large group of people in general who may have um, skills that they can bring to trying to improve 
um, the COVID situation in Canada and COVID data and um, trying to develop tools that are useful to people. And we sort of always morph and grow because we're largely a volunteer organization. And um, I'll talk a little bit later about um, some of the things that we're doing, but really uh, I would say most of our efforts now um, are around um, uh, developing and validating a COVID forecast that we can use in Canada um, that is um, that uh, gives um, a, uh, an accurate or reasonable estimate of the number of actual infections each day, as well as the impact of these infections. So what do we expect the hospitalizations to be, the ICU admissions, the, the long COVID cases and the excess mortality. So the, so the from COVID deaths. And as you can imagine, there are a lot of different um, elements of this um, that need to be solved or sorted out. So we've been working in parallel on a bunch of things. Um, but just I'm just going to share for a moment and I'm going to share with you. Um, sorry, just a second. I'm going to share with you. Um, what the outputs are, um, or the, sorry, the inputs are into our COVID forecast. So first what I'll do is I'm gonna shift this out of the way, and I'm gonna show you some of the, um, the products that we um, produce. Um, well, it's supposed to be every week, but for the last month, uh, well, A, I kind of came to a crashing halt um, because of deadlines and exhaustion. Um, B, uh, we, we changed our model to, to more accurately take into account reinfections and incidental um, uh, severe outcomes. Um, but this is what, um, this is what one of our outputs looks like. So for example, for Ontario, for March 5th to 11th, we have what we call a short form um, forecast. So this is for people who don't want too, too much detail. And what we do is we have um, different um, uh, for word scores um, that are associated with numerical scores. And I'll explain those in a moment. And we provide a little bit of information. So as of that date, um, the estimate was that about one in every 36 people in Ontario um, was infected. Um, we provide a little bit of information about, um, about you know, where COVID is so that people understand that um, um, it's currently the number two or three cause of hospitalization and death um, in, a, in almost all provinces and has been since pretty much since um, the beginning of Omicron. Um, and then we, we have guidance and, um, and that guidance changes depending on, um, on what's, uh, what the, the forecast score is. Um, and that guidance is for everyone and then also for people who are high risk individuals or those who are around high risk, risk individuals. So this is a simple graphic that was uh, developed by, um, by the graphics team, which is entirely um, volunteer. And then we have a long form graphic, which is not as pretty. And this is sort of what I had started out with, um, which is a little bit too complicated and detailed for most people. Um, but what this shows is, so this is the most recent um, um, COVID forecast uh, for Ontario. Here's the word. Um, here's the the uh, the word forecast. This is the number that's associated with it, and this shows that it's currently increasing. And then we show a little graph that compares the province to the rest of the country, and you can see that we came down, but we're starting to go back up again. And then underneath that, we provide for people who want more information. Um, we provide um, sort of um, benchmarked um, estimate. Um, that tell us um, what um, different categories of information or indicator are like compared to that quiet period um, that we were talking about from the summer of 2021, just after a lot of people got vaccinated just before Delta, which was pretty much the lowest point in the, the pandemic in uh, many provinces. So compared to that right now, um, wastewater and infections. Um, this is a an aggregate category that includes wastewater, includes estimated infections, includes test positivity rates, 
those are collectively about 10 times higher um, than infections were at, at that sort of um, quieter spot um, in the pandemic, which also coincidentally um, in Quebec, where we have good data, we know corresponded to under 1% excess mortality. So that was probably um, the the point in the, the epidemic where it was kind of like what things were like before COVID. Um, and then we have a long COVID estimate, which is basically directly proportional to the number of infections. Um, although we're looking at, um, we're thinking about how that might be modified. Um, and then we look at um, reported and predicted hospitalizations and ICU admissions compared to that period. So uh, right now they're just under four times higher um, and then deaths. Um, and this would be reported and expected deaths. And these are about three times higher than that low point. So we're at in Ontario, you know, we had a low point um, back um, just, um, wait a second, December 7th. Uh, something's weird. Sorry, something's weird with my graphing. That is not December seventh, twenty twenty two. This is December. I don't quite know. Oh, anyway, something has something. Oh, see, of course, I'm going to notice this now. Something has shifted out of scale. I think in these graphs, I just have to look at it. Um, but you can see that. Um, you can see that. Um, that this is, um, oh, sorry, because this is all 2022. I'm an, I'm an asshole. <laughs> I'm very tired. <laughs> uh, so you can see that we're at a bit of a low point right now, and it's a, it's, um, it's about where we were just before um, we had another surge in December. And what you don't see on this graph, which I'll show you um, elsewhere, is that, um, is that like our number of infections right now are um, still very high, but that we're, um, that we're uh, at a relatively low point um, for Omicron. My apologies. I'm uh, uh, my brain is fried. I'm progressively getting more and more uh, tired, um, and because uh, there's always so much to do. Um, and then we have the the recommendations that we put um, down here, and generally our recommendations are based on the recommendations um, that uh, the Peterbor Peterborough Ontario Public Health Unit uses. Um, we use different word um, severity scores than they do, and our stuff is benchmarked to low or moderate risk, while theirs is benchmarked to the peak of the, the BA1 wave. Um, so we use slightly different um, word scores, but a lot of the recommendations um, are based on the recommendations you can find on the Peterborough and Ontario um, Public Health Unit. So these are some of the outputs um, that we generate and um, and people are working on right now um, ways to uh, develop campaigns or, or uh, reach out and um, get information to people. Um, uh, you know, but communicating within our networks and using different strategies, because clearly social media is, is not enough. And we've had conversations in the past um, with, for example, the Toronto Star, with media organizations who are really interested in using this index. And then, uh, you know, interest will kind of decline. And then there's this issue, right, that um, we've had a lot of challenges um, with pushback from um, different leaders in different provinces, um, sometimes, um, you know, direct sort of face-to-face -face pushback in media, um, sometimes behind closed doors with funders. So there's a little bit, um, there's been uh, interest and then people are, are not always sure about uptake. So one of the things we're really working on right now, which we have not done mainly because we've been um, sort of fighting to get this stuff out and get the work done and out to people is that we really need to be writing the academic papers that go with this that are peer reviewed. Um, and at that point, I think that that makes it a little bit easier for, um, yeah, it makes it easier for, um, for uh, our work to be replicated um, in by, by media or even by public health units that might be interested. Um, so everything we do is, is freely, um, there's no copyright associated with it as long as um, people give us credit. 
Um, so a major focus right now um, needs to be getting the papers written to support this because we've done a lot of validation work and we need to document that and have it peer reviewed. And, um, and, uh, and then the other thing, of course, is that um, we have to stabilize funding again. So we're, you know, we're always in a boom and bust um, cycle. So we're <laughs> strategizing different ways to support um, uh, sort of a bit more of, um, professional delivery of some elements of our work, because, of course, almost everything is volunteer driven and there are a lot of people in the background who contribute as well as scientists and colleagues who uh, work with me in the background. Um, but a lot of this is volunteer driven and we really do need to be able to, um, uh, you know, uh, put funds together to, um, uh, you know, to support like paying people actually to, to do a lot of this work. But there's some incredible volunteers who are coders, who are others who are automating as much of this as possible. We have amazing volunteers who I've trained to input data every week into this very complex spreadsheet that drives a lot of this. And it's actually really fun and interesting because a lot of people are learning how to do this kind of work and, and are an active part of it, even if it wasn't something that they did professionally in the past. And that's actually been a, a truly wonderful experience because it's kind of like um, everyone is citizen scientists, right? And we're all working together on this and everyone's using whatever skills they have and teaching other people how to do things. And that's been the community that's sort of built up around this has been just amazing. and. Um, is one of the, the most sustaining um, parts of this work. But, you know, as a scientist, for me, another major sustaining part of this work is, um, you know, as a scientist, um, I, uh, I like to see uh, data used properly, described properly. Um, I like to have accurate data that's helpful. And, um, and there's part of me as a scientist that is also just, um, really dismayed um, about the quality of data that we we have in Canada and that we've had a, like actually quite poor quality or incomplete data since the beginning of the epidemic, which or the beginning of COVID, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, so, you know, the goals are to, as a scientist, you know, ensure that there is some source of um, of uh, data that is useful for people to give a real sense of the situation um, that people can make decisions with and then also to develop tools that are useful for people. Okay, so these are the outputs, um, the input to the COVID forecast, which um, I've described to you before. Um, we're revising just uh, a little bit over time, like as we as we experiment with it. Um, this is the current version, and this is a, I'm working on validation of the, the, the hazard index or COVID forte forecast right now. So some of these numbers for some provinces are incomplete. Just this is just I'm just showing you um, an overview screen and we're doing this validation with provinces that report their all cause mortality the fastest, which are Newfoundland, Quebec, Alberta and BC, because we're validating the COVID forecast against excess mortality. Um, to try to have a, a to try to determine whether our scores um, uh, inter can predict um, excess mortality in the country, and then excess mortality itself is a stand-in for um, all of the other um, health-related outcomes um, related to COVID. Um, but we use excess mortality because it's independently reported um, and it's not independent of, sorry, it's not dependent on identifying COVID deaths. So our inputs currently, um, so this is a little bit of my personal uh, working sheet, which is why it's a bit, a bit messy, but we have three components. One is current infections and spread, and we have a trends category where we look at trends over the last 14 days, and we use 14 days because data are very bouncy, especially in smaller provinces, and um, we really do need to do this to be able to um, to be able to uh, look at trends accurately. And we've also shifted recently all of the averages that we're using for our calculations are five week averages. 
Um, and again, the reason for that is to ensure that the the trends and the patterns that we are seeing at, are as um, consistent as possible and as, are not as affected by noise. And that's an enormous problem in smaller provinces, um, but we need to do things consistently. So we look at wastewater and right now we're drawing um, only from the Public Health Agency of Canada wastewater uh, um, dashboard and uh, PHAC or FAC continues to take on or bring on board new sources of wastewater. So what I'm really hoping in Ontario is that some of those samples are going to start being processed and reported by PHAC. And I'd be pretty happy about that too, because they would also be independent of the provinces um, where there's been considerable massage of data. Um, we look at test positivity rate, and then we also estimate the, the daily first time infections, so people being infected for the first time, and then uh, total infection prevalence. So these are the trends. And so you could see that, you know, the week of December 5th to 11th, 2021, you were seeing pretty big increases. These are fold increases in wastewater, um, estimated first time infections, prevalence, et cetera. And then we benchmark um, against, um, against a, a point um, in, in the COVID epidemic when, um, when the severe outcomes of COVID were at their lowest. And that's that, um, that's that, um, uh, uh, that's that um, sort of late May, early June period. Um, um, and uh, we use Quebec as a reference point. So, um, so we look at uh, wastewater, um, uh, we look at, we look at wastewater relative to that point and we, um, we weight it um, by, um, uh, so for example, if there are multiple sources, we weight by population size. Um, we've also weighted wastewater for each region by, um, by either reported or estimated excess mortality. So it's sort of on the same scale. Um, and, uh, and then we've got, you know, the estimated new per, cap new per capita first time infections and prevalence. So that's one of our categories. Um, the other categories are um, um, healthcare system impacts, so um, weekly uh, hospital admissions and ICU admissions. So these would be um, so this is the trends again, um, and uh, our estimated prevalence of long COVID, um, and then our estimates of how many um, from COVID hospitalizations and ICU admissions we would expect. Um, from the estimated number of infections. So these are the trends and the, underneath you have a benchmark relative to that um, relative to that um, period when things were uh, moderate to, to low. And to do this, and I'm gonna talk about this in a moment, one of the things we have to do is we have to estimate what the under reporting rate is for each province for ICU admissions and hospital admissions. Um, and we do this in a couple of different ways, and I'm going to show you some of those data, but let's look at Ontario and um, during the Omicron period. Um, uh, what so our estimates and also from uh, what we um, are seeing from the Canadian Institute for Health Information is that Ontario is uh, reporting fewer than half of its from COVID ICU admissions and fewer than half of its from COVID hospitalizations. So the numbers that you see reported um, are actually half um, of even the, the from COVID hospitalizations, not just the incidentals. Um, and you can see if you look across the board, these are just the current score or the, the scores for this period. You could see that Quebec, um, you know, I mean, it's understandable if not every province gets 100%, right? Um, but Quebec is missing, you know, 6% uh, of its ICU admissions and about 15% of hospitalizations. Uh, Manitoba is, um, is a bit better for hospitalizations than most other provinces, but the ICU reporting is kind of inching up. Um, but you can see that, for example, the um, so Saskatchewan, uh, which really doesn't have great death reporting um, or didn't, um, has better um, rates of hospitalization, ICU admission reporting um, than some other provinces. But we need to do these estimates, and I'll explain in a moment how we do them. 
um, in order to be able to accurately calculate or estimate what the impact of all the COVID infections is. And then our third category is mortality. And again, um, we've got trends. So we look at reported deaths, um, the estimated, the, the new deaths that we estimate that will be coming um, in the, the coming weeks. And then we, we uh, benchmark them against a moderate period. And, um, and then we also do things like compare the estimated new daily deaths to what we expect from influenza. And um, and so you can see, for example, even in early December of last year, we were expecting about three times more from COVID deaths from COVID um, than um, than we would from flu, and that number went up um, over time. This is uh, the week of December twelfth to you know it, that was a huge wave, so it went up um, over that period. And so these are all the components of the, the COVID forecast. And there's also um, a component, um, just like for hospitalizations, where we have to estimate how much underreporting is happening. And I'm gonna talk about this in a moment, but currently um, it looks like Ontario is um, underreporting. It's from COVID deaths by about 2.5 fold. Um, and I'm gonna show you that in a moment by comparison to Quebec, which looks like it's missing about maybe about 13%. Okay, so, um, all right. So stepping back for a moment, I'm going to start talking. So one of the papers that we're working on is talking about um, how we have assessed um, historical, I'm just going to move this out of the way, how we have assessed the quality of ICU and hospital reporting in Canada. Um, and we can only do this because the Canadian Institute for Health Information um, publishes the actual number of COVID admissions. And so what this amazing group of people um, who uh, largely volunteer um, to support this work have done is um, under my uh, careful guidance and supervision, we don't just let people loose, um, we've gone back and we have gone back through archives, through anything that we can find, and we have recorded um, how many hospital admissions and ICU admissions provinces reported contemporaneously, so at the time that they happened, um, how many they've reported to the Public Health Agency of Canada, because we can access these data, and then how many actually occurred. So in this graph, you can see that so CIHI, CIHI is black. This is the Canadian Institute for Health Information um, numbers. And this goes from the data that they've published for now, go from May, um, I've just started the graph at May 2020 because the, it's, um, these are cumulative totals. So that it's just messy before May because reporting was all over the place during the first wave, going up until the end of March, 2022. And so you can see that for Canada, up until this point, there were um, Kai High, and so Kai High reports so the hospitalization numbers, um, or sorry, this is ICU admissions, um, comes from um, basically the hospital billing system. Um, so uh, it's based on hospital um, uh, discharge uh, notices um, or discharges for people, and that's how hospitals get paid for the the. Um, uh, for the work that's done in the hospital. So they tend to be very accurate, complete, and reported in a timely fashion. Um, and they're also reported, um, the database that this draws from, um, provinces need to um, sign um, agreements about data sharing and how CAIHI will use this, but they don't have the ability to alter the data and how it's reported. It's CAIHI that has that ability. And these agreements were established before COVID, and this is very important to know. So for ICU admissions, you can see that by the end of March, 2022, across Canada, there'd be about 39,000 ICU admissions. And of these, um, about, um, so 23,000 had, had been reported to PHAC as of the last time I checked this data was three weeks ago. So as of 2023, um, this is how many of the actual um, ICU admissions had been reported to PHAC and marginally more had been reported publicly. And the, this just shows over time um, what happened. So you can see that this problem goes back actually to the very beginning of the epide epidemic. Um, reporting to PHAC sort of 
um, caught up a bit, but you could see there's still a lot from that first year that hasn't been reported to PHAC. And we're seeing this in, for example, the Canadian Vital Statistics Death Database, where we're seeing COVID deaths show up there that have never made it to PHAC, have never been reported publicly. And we particularly see this for Ontario and BC. So there's still, and we're still seeing deaths being added from the first wave of 2020 to the Canadian Vital Statistics Death Database. So this pattern of not reporting all of um, the ICU admissions and and um, and I'll show you the graph for hospitalization, but it's largely similar. Um, this problem goes back to the beginning of the epidemic, and it improved um, somewhat. Um, and then after that, it's either stayed the same, relatively stayed the same. Uh, we're waiting for the next installment of Kai Hai data. It moved up a bit here, but um, we really, after the BA1 wave, started seeing um, uh, what looks like declining reporting of hospital admission or ICU admissions, certainly. A lot of that comes from Ontario. And then if we look at the individual provinces where we're comparing the number that were reported by the provinces, either on their public pages or to um, um, FAC, PHAC, um, to what CIHI recorded, you can see that in Ontario, for example, from the beginning of the epidemic, so January 2020 to Mar the end of March. Uh, oh, wait a second. Sorry. This is uh, this is the this is up until March 2021 is black. Um, this is from, from um, April 1st, 2021 to March 31st, 2022. So it includes Omicron, and then the whole period is in red. So you can see that overall, Ontario has only ever reported um, about 48% of its ICU admissions. It was marginally higher in the first year of the epidemic and then fell. And um, Ontario really just simply doesn't report these anymore and hasn't for quite a while. The only way we find out how many have happened in Ontario is when PHAC um, updates their, um, there's, a, there's a case data set that can be accessed Stats can just made the most uh, made one available, um, and it's but Ontario reports so slowly to PHAC that it's incredibly out of date, and um, it's it's really challenging. So we should have an update from Kai Hai hopefully in another month or two that will give us a, another six months of data. But we can see that um, from the very beginning of the epidemic, for example, Quebec um, largely reported all of its ICU admissions. Um, Ontario has only ever reported about half. And, you know, I remember Francois Legault, uh, you know, complaining in 2020 about Ontario not reporting. And uh, it's very true. He's right. Um, a lot of people thought it was just politicians getting mad at each other, but he was right. Um, and so BC for ICU admissions, generally BC's improved and generally BC's quite good. Sometimes the numbers are a little bit higher and that's because the discharge number, the, the the timing of the period, the discharge dates may not quite match up to um, the, you know, the province might report that someone has, um, you know, a certain number of ICU admissions, but Kai Hai is based on when they're discharged. So that can be, uh, that can be later. So sometimes like in BC, um, uh, it's it's a little bit later, but you can see that BC is actually largely reported. Um, and then the Prairie provinces are a bit, they're actually, I mean, they're, they're not 100%, they're pretty good, but we definitely, Ontario, there's a serious problem. And then for the most part, the Atlantic provinces really have underreported. Um, this is ICU admissions, the information for um, hospitalizations is pretty similar, um, um, except that they're, not underreported quite as much as ICU admissions. And then for death, Tara, we can't hear you. Could you have bumped your mic or is it the internet? There is a way to call in with a telephone. I 
Let me just see if I can find that. It's in. Oh, we lost her internet altogether. Mentality, but some provinces like Ontario. Oh, sorry. We just lost your internet. Is there something? Oh, okay. Here, let me just switch to my data, my cell phone data, because that might um that might help. There is a way you can also phone There's... in if you um if you run into a problem again, you can so that the audio would be over the telephone. If you click on the microphone, okay. it'll it'll give you a telephone number and a user code so that you can get right in back into the call. Just in case it happens again, I'm just telling you that's you. the way. It happens again? Okay. Oh, thank you. And I'm just... I... We're not hearing you again. Oh, thank you, Dorothy, for putting that in. Um, but then you need, need the meeting number. If... Here we go. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you again. And we're okay, seeing your sorry. Firefox um, icon or whatever, what not an icon, your display for Firefox is in front of the slides right now. Oh, weird. Okay. Oh, okay. And Dorothy put the numbers and the access codes in the chat if you run into a problem okay. and need to phone in. Thanks. Okay. Um, are you seeing a series of graphs right now with blue yes. and red and pink? Okay, yes. good. And is my Firefox icon still in front of? No, it's gone. Uh, are you... it's... it's gone? Okay. So I apologize. We're, as you can probably see at my window, we're having a snowstorm. So uh when the or snow anyway so uh the internet's not always great when they're when we have snow um okay so um so one of the things we've been looking at is the amount of underreporting of deaths that's happening um from covid deaths and um not incidental or or with covid deaths and um these graphs are showing they're kind of similar to the others with kai high but we're using excess mortality and um, and uh, and as and uh, no anyway, I'm not going to go into a lot of the details of it, but no surprise, you can see that Ontario is um, probably only reporting um, at least up until the end of March 2022. Um, you know, 53 percent of um, expected uh, from COVID deaths or excess mortality, whereas Quebec's reported COVID deaths account for a little bit more than excess mortality and. That makes sense, right? There are some people who are, um, who uh, there are some with COVID deaths, um, especially because COVID deaths are more likely to occur in people who are quite a bit older. So you actually would expect the reported numbers to be a bit higher than excess mortality, which is what you see in Quebec. And then across the country in general, up until the end of that period, Canada had reported about um, 60% of its from COVID deaths. Um, and none of the provinces are particularly good um, um, at uh, this kind of reporting. And, um, and then at the top, and this is something that we're still working on, but essentially one of the things we're doing is stepping through different, uh, so every two months through, throughout the epidemic for each of Canada's major regions, um, we've stepped through and we've said um, how many hospitalizations were there, um, actual versus reported, um, how many would we have expected, um, what were the vaccination rates in that province, what were, you know, what was the um, variant at the time and what were, what was the um, uh, severity of that variant in terms of of um, deaths and so every two months we go through all of the Canadian regions and we also adjust for seroprevalence so we know what percentage of the population in these regions had been infected at least once and when we basically um, uh, adjust the reported the Kai High reported hospital admissions ICU admissions um, current excess mortality and then this expected total mortality is is um, uh, is sort of an um, an estimate of um, what we expect once all the reporting comes in 
Um, you can see that for the most part, if you control for the levels of seroprevalence in Canadian regions, um, you can see that, um, and if you control for the severity and vaccination rates and everything else, um, that, um, that there are also differences in uh, the rates at which people are hospitalized in different parts of the country. And this is very interesting, and I'm not going to talk about it today, but actually, I think that's predicting the levels of excess mortality that we're seeing in some parts of Canada. So they're currently higher right now um, in Atlantic Canada, likely because there wasn't a lot of exposure before Omicron, but also I think because um, in Atlantic Canada, um, you have much lower rates of hospital admission and ICU admission, um, even when you adjust for seroprevalence, even when you adjust for population age differences, vaccination rates, everything else. It looks that like fewer people are being admitted to hospital and ICU in Atlantic Canada, even though the excess mortality is largely, it's uh, significant, sorry, statistically indistinguishable from the rest of the country when you sort of do this um, type of comparison. And, um, and, um, and then some provinces like Eastern Canada, Ontario and Quebec, um, appear to admit slightly more people to um, to ICU and hospital than the rest of the country, um, but it's nowhere near this this difference that we see in Atlantic Canada. So some of the things we're also doing is trying is looking at and saying what do we think? You know, for example, um, we know that um, uh, Canada for the number of hospital admissions that we've had for COVID or that we've reported. Canada has an exceptionally high mortality rate compared to most countries or compared to most high income countries, much higher mortality rate than the, U, um, than the US, um, than France, um, where we can also compare. Um, and, but fairly comparable to the UK, which is also higher than the US and France. But the UK and Canada have very small numbers of hospital beds per capita compared to a lot of other OECD countries. And the UK, like Canada, has admitted far fewer people to hospital and ICU um, for the, you know, when you look at the seroprevalence levels and the percentage of the population that's likely being infected over time. So we seem to share uh, a, a bit of a problem with the UK, which is that we don't admit as many people to hospital and ICU. And our mortality rates for the people who are admitted are quite a bit higher or, or double on um, what we're seeing, for example, in the US and, um, and much higher than are seen in France. So some of this story is complicated by not only are we underreporting um, the hospital and ICU admissions that we have, but we're already admitting a lot fewer people to hospital and ICU. Um, than in quite a number of other countries. And that in turn is likely having an effect on the survival rates. Um, so, but the main upshot is that our hospitalization numbers with the exception, uh, well, Quebec and actually BC up until the end of March, 2022 was pretty decent. Um, our hospitalization numbers are um, largely underreported, very much so in Ontario. And it's very likely that most of what we're, what is reported or many of what's reported um, are actually people who really do need hospitalization, um, and we're we're um, uh, there. We tend to have more. We, I suspect that we admit um, we either admit fewer people or those who we do admit are significantly sicker, so the survival rates are lower. Okay, so this is some of what this is one of the papers we're working on is. A, saying how much does each province underreport? And we know we've got data from Kai High, and we say, how bad is it? So we do, so for deaths, it's excess mortality we're comparing to, but we're, we're looking at this for hospital admissions. And all of this comes back, of course, to um, the, the COVID forecast and the hazard index, because if we're going to assess what the, um, the hazard is um, in a particular province for a particular week, we need to have at least a ballpark estimate of how much they underreport, or at least how much they have um, historically. And we also need to know this information to get a sense of how many hospital admissions we expect um, based on the number of infections. So, um, so 
uh, I know that there's a, a lot going on with this, um, but uh, but this is really these are really key pieces that we need to be able to have um, a good forecast. And um, and so uh, one of the things that we do, for example, is um, I'm just going to take you over to one of my other pages. Is um, so in addition to Kai High, we also estimate. Um, how many hospital admissions and ICU admissions we should be seeing um, throughout Omicron um, compared to compared to what's actually reported, um, and we do estimates of, for example, the underreporting. So, for the Omicron period overall for Canada, it looks like from COVID hospitalizations have been underreported um, by 1.58 fold, and from COVID ICU admissions have been underreported. Um, by 1.5 fold, and then we have these numbers that we have these estimates that we do for um, for each of the provinces. And to explain a little bit how we actually estimate how many should occur, um, again we go back to Quebec, and um, I'm going to go to our weekly report, and I am going to go to the um, Quebec hospitalization and ICU data. And uh, so what we do is um, in Quebec, one of the thing, the many things Quebec does is they do a weekly survey and they ask people, and it's a properly sampled population survey, and they ask people, did you test positive on a rat or by PCR for COVID this week? And they're still doing it, it happens every week. So based on that, uh, um, we can estimate the the prevalence of the percentage of the Quebec population that is infected in any given week. And when you know that, and when you know the number of hospital beds that Quebec has, which you know will go up and down a bit, but we we know that fairly clearly, you can actually calculate and say in such and such a week, this percentage of the population was infected. That means that. Uh, a maximum of this percentage of people who were admitted to hospital this week um, could have had COVID incidentally, meaning that they just happened to have COVID because certain, a high percentage of the population is infected. So we calculate that for Quebec, and um, and this shows um, the predicted hospitalizations, the from COVID hospitalizations, and the reported total hospitalizations from Quebec hospital admissions, and then we've done this for ICU as well. So this is what this plot looks like for Quebec. And then um, because our model allows us to estimate the number of total infections, daily infections in other provinces based on, you know, their test positivity rates and other things compared to Quebec, we can then use this to say, uh, to talk about the estimated number of hospitalizations that are from COVID, not, not um, with, that we would expect in uh, other provinces. So this is what the graph looks like for, um, you can see, sorry, it's just loading slow. Um, uh, this is Canada, the blue at the top here. So this is what the expected number of from COVID hospitalizations would be. And you can see it's going up again here. Um, this is March 24th, 2023. So from the trends that we're seeing, it's looking like that's going to start going up again. Um, so this is how we estimate how many um, uh, admissions we should be seeing um, in uh, different provinces on specific dates. And um, in some provinces that appears to have worsened, but for many, um, the under reporting of the from COVID hospitalizations looks pretty comparable to what we saw by comparing to the Kai Hai data until the end of March. Um, okay, and then, you know, from that, we also do, we estimate, uh, you know, what the hospitalization costs are, um, you know, that's just from Kai Hai information. We, we estimate the percent over hospital capacity provinces are um, based on, um, that's just the from COVID cases. So there are other things that routinely get populated from these estimates, which you can find in our weekly report and which may be useful. Uh, we've always hoped <laughs> that this type of information might uh, stimulate some kind of movement on the part of governments. Um, Kai High has also come out with more recent estimates that almost perfectly match uh, the estimates that we've made as well. 
well um, in terms of the cost. But you can see that since the beginning of Omicron, um, the estimated hospitalization costs would be nearly $8 billion in Canada. Um, okay, so we do all of that. And then, but what I wanted to show you the last thing that we're working on, and all of this is sort of happening at once. And um, it is, um, so it looks like there's not a lot happening. I'm pretty quiet on Twitter, mainly because I'm just working like a dog, as they say. But um, I'm really trying to get the full formal academic. I'm trying to go through all those things that, I mean, I am a sci I'm a professor, I'm a researcher. And this is, I, you know, pre all of this, I would never have thought that I would ever, you know, just move through and try to get information out to people. Um, but, um, but we need to, at this point, um, slow down and start doing some of that so that it can be taken seriously. And also because I think as there are starting to be um, class action lawsuits and others, I think that there is so little data out there that we really have, um, um, there aren't a lot of estimates. And I really want to make sure that this is all um, really backed up um, so that, um, so that uh, you know, there have been some very unhappy provinces about the work we're doing. So I also want to make sure this is done to um, protect, uh, I mean, the organization is, we're not a formal organization, but to make sure that we're not sued, um, which is something I'm um, uh, potentially, get, I'm getting a little bit more concerned about. So I want to make sure that we have everything done so that we're um, in a situation where um, we're not going to be um, all of the sort of uh, where where that is not going to be deployed by provinces that are facing um, potentially legal blowback about responses to COVID. Um, but what we're doing is uh, so among the other things in turn, uh, including documenting how we estimate under reporting, um, in, uh, we're writing papers. We're writing papers to write to describe the under reporting, to describe the models we use, to describe. Um, um, to describe uh, some of the excess mortality work we've already done before, um, to describe that. And then finally, the sort of final piece of that, um, or the last paper, is the validation of our COVID um, forecast scores. And we've done it for now, just up until the end of March 2022, because we have chi high data that we can verify with. Um, but um, our forecast is based on what provinces reported and what our estimates were of what the underreporting rate was. And um, this is the Omicron period starting at the beginning of December. Um, uh, we have the benefit of knowing what the chi high numbers were and that our estimates were largely similar. Um, um, but also after March um, 31st, 2022, we've, there's a real drop off in excess mortality reporting. Um, which is slowly filling in. So hopefully by the time we get to finishing this paper, we'll have a couple months more of data so we can show this validation a bit further. But essentially uh, what we now know is that, um, so our COVID forecast score um, it used to be a 16 point range, but we've increased it up to 22 um, to be able to get the full sort of dynamic range that we need. And so we now know that our COVID forecast scores are predicting percent excess mortality, all age excess mortality in, in uh, the fastest reporting provinces. So Newfoundland and Labrador, Quebec, Alberta, and BC, that it's almost perfectly predicting it. So what you can see is that here, which is um, January 8th, 2022, um, it predicted about 20% excess mortality and remember, this is a prediction and deaths don't, don't occur until a couple of weeks later. And by and by January 20, January 22nd, so that's 16 days later, um, that this is where the excess, the, the weekly excess mortality is. So we're pretty, um, um, it's, it's really, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's very, um, uh, it, it's useful because it allows us to say a few weeks before it happens, this is what the situation is like right now. Um, and this is the amount of excess mortality and um, this will result in with excess mortality being a stand in for other um, severe outcomes. So that's um, essentially what we're working on. There's a lot 
um, kind of in motion. Um, I'm just going to stop screen sharing. Um, there's, um, there's a lot in motion right now, um, and like a, an almost insurmountable amount of work, but <laughs> we are slowly, uh, stepping through it. And I'm really trying to make sure that this is formally done. Um, so that, um, so that, uh, those who may want to use some of this information um, for public reporting to reach more people or, you know, even if PHAC or others would be interested um, in some of it, that it's supported by the full, uh, you know, peer-reviewed academic process behind it um, instead of just some people on the internet and someone on Twitter, which is really where we are right now and so we need to start doing things the slow and formal way and with that um that's it well uh thank you very much uh dr moriarty that's a fantastic body of work and all the iterations and all the calculations and all the relational uh pieces of it is uh i mean we can we can see why it consumes all your time and more and it, it's an incredible oh yeah gift to the country as far as i'm concerned that you're that you've been able to um put so much uh, of you know time and focus and and to be able to um yeah. get us this data that otherwise as you've very clearly shown is is either deliberately or uh naively being suppressed um across the province or and or we you know we know the surveillance systems maybe aren't up to snuff either so it's a combination of reasons yes, yes. I, I, I agree i agree yeah so and, you know, I, we always talk about Quebec, but Quebec before COVID had a really centralized, really effective health data reporting system that the country had invested, or the pro country, <laughs> the province had invested in nearly 20 years before, right? So Quebec had been doing a lot of this long before COVID and other Canadian provinces were sort of at best doing it piecemeal. So Quebec also really had a lot of experience with it before, which is partly why they were well-placed. Well, and it's great that it hasn't been compromised either. Um, exactly. and, and the survey yeah. that they started, I gather, is pretty um, pretty important too. It, it correlates, I think, the it is. data. It's huge, um, yeah. Same thing yeah. in the UK, I guess, right? The Zoe survey there, I think, has been, uh, very powerful. So there were a few questions and I actually had um, a few myself, um, but let's see if I can. Um, and you talked about Peterborough, so I put in the link actually and Dr. Piggott's coming in three weeks. So uh, we'll be happy to host him. And um, I think Lynn asks if you can clarify current excess mortality versus expected. Um, I think, I, I don't, Lynn, I don't know if you want to speak speak if you just what's happening right now um in terms of current excess mortality versus what would be expected oh. and i was actually wondering while you were doing the presentation too does excess mortality prediction does it naturally decay because all the people who might have died are dead now like i mean is that is that a thing in the way you look at that data so yes and i'll show you in a moment so one of the things we've been doing is predicting excess mortality and comparing to what's coming in and so we have an excess mortality tracker on our website and um so and I, we've just been doing this for omicron but i'm going to go oh, there we go um and some of the provinces are slow reporting but i'm going to show you um uh so the last data I've entered from StatsCan for excess mortality go until December 5th. Not many provinces hadn't reported until like up to that date. Many are far behind. But for example, the expected COVID excess mortality that our model predicts here it is for Newfoundland and Labrador. And this is what's being reported. Uh, sorry, this is the excess all cause mortality. The black is the expected COVID excess mortality. And then this is what the province has reported in terms of COVID deaths. So we're tracking that and we're sort of trying to visualize that right now. And um, a lot of provinces are pretty far behind. Um, but for example, um, here is um, BC. So this is what we expect for BC. This is what we're seeing. Um, Saskatchewan is matching pretty well as well. Um, and then we have um, Quebec and um, so 
uh, Quebec reports some of its younger age groups a little bit later. Um, but here's what we expect for Quebec for excess mortality. And then oh, this is cumulative. So um, there are, for example, there's displacement mortality. Sometimes people die in a wave who would have died two months later. The important thing is that it catches up. Um, and the, the uh, age-specific infection fatality rates we use for a lot of our calculations are based on excess mortality, um, which is why uh, over, and, and those themselves are, are, have been calculated based on, um, you know, annual excess mortality. So over time, you would expect over the course of a year that they would match up. And you can see in Quebec that they largely do. Um, Ontario, we're just in the process of updating the model, but you can see. So Ontario just hasn't reported a lot of its excess mortality. We have a good match up until February of 2022, and then there's just so much outstanding reporting, but we expect that Ontario should be up at around, um, you know, 14,000 deaths and uh, excess, so from COVID deaths, and there have been about 5,000 reported. Um, so we do that. And then, um, and and so this is sort of how we monitor um, how the, the predictions are working. And then uh, the other question about uh, about real time excess mortality is what you're is what you're saying. Yeah, and Lynn is what you're asking. Another about? question: Can you clarify the end date that your risk score is validated for excess mortality? That is the end of the last graph. If BC is oh. severe now at nine, oh, I think that's in the forecast side. Can I use this pre yeah. to predict the excess mortality in sixteen days? Mm. Yes, yes. So the we validate up until we always adjust the model up until the most recent date that excess mortality is available. So uh, there is a problem. One of the tables from Stats Can is not formatted correctly. So I haven't been able to do up until December thirty first, which is our most recent date. In some provinces, not all. Um, and but every time those come out, we readjust the we you know we readjust the model. We make sure you know, we do our monthly we we adjust to zero prevalence and all that. So we do that every month when excess mortality comes out. Um, but yes, so um, from what we um, from what we see right now, um, if the uh, score in Ontario for March 26 to April 1st, 2023 is 5.6, then that means that we would expect about um, roughly about 6% excess mortality in Ontario um, two to three weeks from now. So that's, so that's what we're really trying to do is have that numeric number. Uh, so, so far um, it really, um, the, the number corresponds very well. Um, to the percentage excess mortality. And then in the, so in a province, um, I have to actually look up how many uh, deaths Ontario normally has in a week. Um, um, so from that, and we can, well, here I can actually show you um, in our weekly charts, if we go to um, the expected deaths, we go here, um, and that's Quebec. Let me go to Ontario. So we would expect from the infections this week, um, we would expect about uh, roughly right now, we'd expect about 24 deaths, excess deaths a day in Ontario from COVID. And John just showed the stats showing 30 a week, I guess. Did you say 24 a day? No, a week. Um, this is. Uh, this is 24 a day. So this is at the upside of this um, if we, but the forecast is right around the state. So we would ex be expecting about 24 per day. Hmm. And and what did you say Ontario is reporting right now? Uh, John showed in his intro slide 30 a yeah. week, I think, right, John? Yeah, for yeah. two weeks ago, it was 30. As reported yeah. on the PHO website, right? Yes attributed to COVID. So that's the thing. They're not catching any of the, like, I think their definition is only died within 30 days of a, of a mm -hmm. 
diagnosis and maybe even only died in hospital or in ICU or something, right? It's very yeah. limited, their definitions. It's very restricted. I mean, BC, for example, does not report any severe outcome or even a, an infection if it's someone's second infection, if it's a reinfection. So there's all kinds of sort of, um, and it's very hard to get clear definitions. We'll find out what the provinces are actually using for definitions and it shifts. Um, so, yeah, so BC just doesn't report, uh, any infections or severe outcomes of reinfections if it's someone's second, third or whatever. And, you know, one of the things that we had to do in the last month, and that's partly why things slowed down and stalled was because, um, the model we were using for our forecast before, um, was based on assuming that every death that occurred. Um, um, if we could estimate the number that were from COVID and incidental, that we would, um, that uh, after that, that we could assume that the percentage of the population that we could estimate had been infected from that um, would be, would make sense and that it would correspond to um, first infections. And as we've slowly worked our way through, um, you know, we don't have all of the Canadian population infected yet. Mostly the people who are left to be infected for the first time are older. We'd expect more um, severe outcomes. So our assumption for a long time, or at least what we worked with was that, um, was that the, the expected mortality would gradually uh, decline and burn out once you had everyone infected in the population. But the problem is, and this has been clear for quite a long time now from looking at excess mortality in other countries that have had more people infected much longer before Canada, is that excess mortality has stabilized, right? It's not really declining significantly further if you look at the cumulative excess mortality. In the US, sure it is because their excess mortality in 2020 and 21 was, was extraordinary, right? So yes, relative to that, it's coming down. But if you look at the UK, for example, if you look at uh, a lot of countries, cumulative excess mortality is increasing or stabilizing largely over time now. And uh, it's sort of flatline. It's not really declining much further. Um, and so we're not seeing I think that there is some effect of depletion, as they say, of the population of susceptible people, but I don't think it's as big, um, or I think that reinfections are contributing. So one of the things we did was we um, estimated how many COVID deaths um, in Quebec, for example, are due to um, reinfections and how many would be due to first time infections. And to that, for that, we compare changes in seroprevalence over time in Quebec to the um, estimated um, prevalence from that survey data that Quebec does. And from that, we can say for specific waves, we can say, you know, from the, the Serrano survey data, you know, it looks like there were three and a half times more people infected than the seroprevalence data um, uh, indicate. And so that would suggest that there were three times more reinfections than first time infections. And can we use those ratios to then, um, to then, so when we do a model and we say, do we assume that all reported deaths are only first time infections? Or um, do we assume that a certain proportion in each wave are reinfections? Um, and if we do the model in those two different ways, which one of them more accurately predicts what we see for excess mortality? And what it turns out is that the one that takes into account deaths from reinfections is the one that accurately predicts excess mortality. And, you know, we've had very high excess mortality in the summer um, and in the fall um, in fast reporting provinces. And, um, and it's not explainable entirely from first time infections and reinfections are clearly contributing. And I think that that's why cumulative excess mortality, uh, percent excess mortality in other countries that have had more people infected is just not really like it came down um, early in Omicron and then it's just remained stubbornly high. And it doesn't really seem to ever be declining further. And I think that that's what our baseline rate looks like with reinfections. Hmm. I don't think um, that's very well understood. I don't think in public. No, no. 
no yeah but you know i do think like uh, canada for example has had a really horrible i think probably a much worse omicron period than than the uk for example or the us these are the estimated total daily infections and i do think that it is coming down a bit but we're starting to see this this creeping back up um and um you know some of this we don't we when more data come in uh we become more certain about it um but it certainly looks like we have another wave starting um but it's not clear how big it will be right and whether it will be more of a, a swell um but still that baseline that we're at even at the lowest is still considerably higher than pre-omicron um and i do think we're going to be seeing kind of a baseline rate of about five to ten percent excess mortality across canada as long as we continue to have um COVID infections that's good um have you been following what's happening like in india and finland today where they're really high um suddenly it seems um, um and i guess do you look at the variants like the different xb yeah that kind of thing in terms of yeah, so, you know, I've been worrying a lot that we would see a huge XBB 1.5 wave. Um, I think once we sort of figured out when the first time infections in Canada were, once we started um, separating infections that are reinfections versus first time, these are the estimated first time daily infections in Canada. You can see that the, the summer and fall were, in fact, the worst um, of the, the Omicron period in Canada. I think we actually had so many people infected in this period in Canada that that is partly why we didn't see um, XBB 1.5 take off as quite as aggressively as it has in other countries because we have a very recent quite really quite large wave for first time infections it looks like in fact it was considerably higher than the ba1 wave um at the beginning of um, 2022 so i don't know whether that's what's happening in canada and i've so i haven't had time to read more about what's happening in finland and india i'm seeing some of it i haven't had a chance to sort of look, read, and think, right? And and sort of try to form an, an informed opinion about it. Um, but I do think that, you know, we had um, a vaccination campaign in here and we haven't really had any new vaccines since then. And so I think that based on what we've seen is that it's kind of inevitable that we're gonna come back up again, just once the protection from the recent vaccinations and infections starts declining, um, that um, we're just simply going to see, we're gonna have a surge of people who are infectable again, and it'll go back up. Thanks. Yeah. There's a couple yeah. more, and I don't know how long you can stay. We're already over the time we promised you could escape. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, whatever works for you. And I know I talk too much. Oh, no. well, we're all fascinated. Uh, and we and, and, yeah, we do <laughs> applaud and admire the work that you're doing to, uh, it's like a lighthouse beacon, right? Really, uh, uh, you know, trying to show, shine the light on, on information that's, that's important and relevant to us all. And that's so hard to find otherwise. Yeah. So uh, Kevin asked about I guess how PHAC, how receptive they've been to your work, and I guess, and I was wondering the same thing in terms of ongoing funding for this work, um, and yeah, I guess any comments on that or? Yeah, so so first of all, PHAC has been wonderful. Um, they are in a difficult situation, right? They still need to get data from provinces, and they 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 need to use. It's not required by law in Canada. It's actually optional. Um, reporting of COVID to PHAC. So they're in a difficult situation. They've been wonderful. Um, so funding, yeah. So ultimately, um, yes. Yeah, so we're going to go, you know, we can go back. There are also other, um, some other organization. I, I don't think funding will be, um, I don't think it's going to be an issue. It's just getting it all written and done. It's so much work, right? And that's the hardest thing, honestly, that and being tired. We're all really tired. 
So I don't think there's going to be a problem with that. And but I do think that getting those peer reviewed, like doing the full, slow, formal academic process is essential now. Um, and it's essential to provide um, support that, you know, other organizations might need to be able to justify using our stuff, right? I mean, and I understand that as a scientist. I, you know, I it's important. It's a really crucial thing to do. <laughs> so I think that big thing we need to do is do that. And we've spent so much time trying to respond immediately to needs. I don't think COVID's going away. Um, I think we need to get this done, get the funding in place, professionalize some of it, you know, so that um, also that it's not running entirely on volunteer labor, which for the most part it is again now, right? We we go boom and bust, but also so that um, that routine functions are just taken care of on a daily basis, and um, so um, other so parts of our group are working on developing, um, you know, communication plans and things to try that um, I will support, for example, but I'm not, I really don't know much about it. So people are working on that with existing materials we have. And then, uh, and then we just really need to prioritize getting some of that formal academic work done. And then I think once that's done and we've bitten the bullet and, and any of you have written papers know how long it takes, um, that um, that uh, a lot of things are easier, and we certainly are going to be able to get re short term funding for some stuff. It's just that um, instead of always responding in this emergency mode and trying to get things out as fast as possible, that we need to we need sustainability. And and if there is very little information out there, like this can't go down, right? Our forecast went down for a month because I redid the model. I got like. That cannot happen for it to go down because one person gets overloaded. Yeah. It's not. No, it's not. It's not like yeah. we're the only. No, and it's also we just people need it, right? Service. So we need to, we need just to be smart about how we're doing things and and um, and sort of resist people. People, there's always more that's needed, but stop doing that and just do like you know document what we do have. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks. Thanks for taking the time with us today. <laughs> you share this. Yeah, that's okay. Well, this is important, right? Uh, yeah. And I, I and I do that. I'm still looking for other questions. Someone commented on, on that drop or the adjustment in the Quebec data um, a few weeks ago that um, by a bit, their death had now I think they undercounted by 1,367 that it had been undercounted and they corrected it up, I think, or did they actually drop it? I'm not sure. Uh, was it the the hospital numbers or I see the, you? You're right. I see you. It wasn't deaths. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So some of it goes back to. Um, so it depended. So I see you went up, but some of that is also a little bit pre. Um, right. Pre. It's not, some of it's a bit pre Omicron, and then some of their hospitalization numbers went down a bit. I think what happened was that the Kai Hai data came out, and even though Quebec is probably one of the best reporting provinces of the country, they're like, "Oh my God, we missed!" And they actually went and found them and reported them. Right? Unlike, mm -hmm. unlike some other provinces that shall not be named that are just ignoring the, you know, what's come out from Kai Hai. But yeah, so it's the hospitalizations and and um, but they update everything, um, and we update from there. We we pull their data every week and they they reallocate the the dates when things happen so um but a chunk of that is also from before omicron as well and honestly it's a drop in the bucket compared to how many i mean during omicron there have been hundreds of thousands of hospital admissions in canada the numbers they're talking about are a drop in the bucket compared to the number that have actually happened mm -hmm. it's a very small change okay kevin you have a Popped up with a question. You're needed. Yeah, I just I just want to thank um, uh, Dr. Mariati so so much for for sharing her knowledge and for all the work you're doing. I mean, I know it's it's a slog like being a volunteer, but I guess I did have a 
quick one. Um, do you think that we'll ever have national standards for, for collecting this data? Do you think that <laughs> there's a, a sense from above that that's, that's the path that um, PHAC may, may be going? I think that there has very much, so I think that that has always been wished for um, by PHAC and that the attempts to get there, in fact, there is a national standard for the case definition for COVID, for example, and most provinces, if you ask them what the case definition is that they use for reporting, they word for word <laughs> report, you know, what's on the PHAC website, which is also the World Health Organization case definition, but in fact, they don't do it in practice. So, or many don't do it in practice. So the idea is, yes, I mean, I think very much that there's a desire for there to be national standards, but you need everyone to cooperate on it. And, you know, I am hoping that because of this, you know, the, the, the tying of health funding to improved data reporting, health data reporting in Canada, that there, because there's a little bit of a stick there now, right? Or a carrot, I guess, an incentive to do better reporting. Um, because if you don't do it, you won't get more money. The question is how much that's going to be enforced, I whether there's going to be a province to province difference in it, right? Um, our country has been really woefully unable to cooperate on a lot of healthcare related issues. We're really not good at this. I mean, we have a massive healthcare crisis that I just, I, I, I don't know. Um, the idea that additional healthcare dollars are tied to better reporting um, is really important. And I think that that is crucial and that's crucial for PHAC. Um, but it sort of depends on whether that is enforced or not. And, you know, as we're seeing with increasing privatization of, of services in many provinces that just seems to be happening without I don't know. I mean, do we need a federal response to wrap people in the knuckles? And I know um, the federal government's going to claw back some uh, money that went to was it Saskatchewan or uh, anyway, you know, for for services that are being delivered privately when they should be public. But I think a lot of that depends on this very complex and fraught and tenuous relationship between the federal government and the provinces is the big concern. So even if I mean even if we should have a national standard, but um, even if that's what's desired, getting there. And we don't still have, we've been working for decades on having good provincial health data sharing agreements and um, we still don't have it, right? So uh, I don't know. I mean, historically we haven't had a good track record, but we do have Kai High now, for example, which does is able to report um, for quite a few provinces. And so in some ways it's an arm's length body that can do that kind of work. The problem is it's just very slow. Hey, thank you. Uh, yeah. Dorothy, okay. you have a question, but I just want to, there are three things in the chat I didn't want to lose sight of, and maybe you're going to bring up uh, one of them. Like, cause like, one of them is about work and occupational data and can you distill that from uh from the data that you're collecting one of them's about long covid and one of them's about mm -hmm. young people dying and the cardiac and mm -hmm. you know and and just how i guess just i think to comment on that and how do we um how do we make that better known or better understood the impact that it's having not just on the older people but on um yeah. young young death so anyways go ahead dorothy i just didn't want to and then i think we will have to t we probably should let you go at 3 30 so that we uh, don't abuse your generosity so <laughs> <laughs> well it's always really fun that's the thing it's, it's also really nice to talk to people who are really interested in this and sort of interested in some of the details of how the work's done because it's uh, it's it's complex. It's trivial, non-trivial to to do it, and it involves a lot of evaluating and trying to measure the quality of data. And so, as as a nerd and as an academic, I love talking about it because it's quite a challenge. And and you know, it, it's nice when people understand that. Thanks. Having been part of some of those say organizations, understand a bit about the challenge. Uh, and, but 
the uh, the drum that I'm beating is the one that you've heard me beat before, which is the stuff to do with occup with job related data. Yeah. And if if the if this general data is so crappy, the the mm -hmm. uh, information about jobs and sort of their influence is really even worse. And mm -hmm. one of the things I I'm writing um, right now about meatpacking and looking at uh, Alberta and Cargill. And what's fascinating in some ways and incredibly frustrating is the minister inserting in their narrative about what was happening is that it was exception it was sort of special circumstances in at mm -hmm. Cargill that it was community spread because the these Filipino workers were carpooling and living in large groups yeah. and and yeah. it, and they kept on then in their messages constantly saying. And this yeah. is like from freedom of information request documents and emails. The message was, well, it's really not the, the, the workplace, even though they're like 700 pe at the point when there were 700 people infected and mm -hmm. public health was saying, well, maybe. Um, so there's this sort of. Um, it's feeds with the lack of data feeds that kind of stuff yeah. and then. Yeah. As John said in his presentation, that if we don't have the data, then, you know, or people aren't counting, it's a don't ask, don't tell, and you can't yeah. do any prevention. There's no, yeah, there's no sort of validation for folks like me or hygienists or John, who's hygienist, and Kevin, and, you know, all of us who care about what's happening in workplaces and who understand um that this virus is in the air and places like meatpacking plants are really good places for it to yeah. get shared around and pointing fingers at at workers is just is a lie uh, frankly. Yeah. uh and it and it's racist and all kinds of other things so i'm just yeah. trying to think you know where can we go after getting occupational data i mean where are there opportunities to try and sort of get this on the agenda I think that one of the best ways to do that might have to be um, retrospective surveys, but I think stats can might need to get involved. Mm -hmm. I don't think that provinces, I mean, I've been watching the, I, I look at the PHAC case data set, which includes some occupational information. I've been looking at that since almost since the beginning and it never really went you know, any further than, you know, daycare. And, and, and it's just yeah. the level of non-reporting of that category is extraordinary. Plus, no one's being tested in some of these age groups either, right, in most provinces. Mm -hmm. So my guess is that, you know, I think that, for example, um, and I think this is something that maybe, um, you know, the Canada's chief um, uh scientist essentially would need to get involved in the same way that there was push related to long covid and then stats can did surveys um, related to long covid which provided the first sort of um i mean we can do estimates right based on what we'd expect from uk data but that's not the same as collecting it i think that the canadian health measures survey or stats can might be the way that we could do that um, but it's a big process, right, to get stats. And I think there's certainly lots of interest at stats can. Um, this is a topic that is uh, of uh, great interest, actually. But I think it just may require um, some, uh, some uh, organized and public advocacy for this. Mm -hmm. um, that would be um, led, you know, that would be led by um, some pretty, um, you know, like the National Science Advisor, the office that, you know, like some pretty, some, um, uh, some pretty uh, high profile scientist. Yeah, exactly. Right. Who can sort of push that to happen. Mm -hmm. And I don't, and I honestly don't think that there'll be I don't think there would be that much resistance to it um, if it was done in a certain way and framed as the responsible thing to do. And um, and there have been examples, right? We need this information, um, but I think it need there needs to be public momentum um, to to make it go forward. Well, and I think it's just going to be a campaign, right? Which is what it was like for long COVID. Um, but there are people who I think would get behind that, and I I. Sometimes, you know, like StatsCan, for example, or even PHAC, 
they're empowered, right, by public advocacy for certain it they may have well wanted to do it for a long time, but can't get the, you know, the leverage or whatever. So sometimes from outside that advocacy can help well, ensure that that goes ahead. So I, as somebody writing a book, I'm told I need to develop a platform. Platform means yeah. getting my name out there. I would be happy to write yeah. a piece with some other folks about why this is necessary. Um, yeah. and perhaps use the conversation as a, as a platform to do that because it's read and it, it gets published in a bunch of places. Um, if you yeah. uh, work it right. So I'll be back to you. Thanks. Dorothy. Yeah. And, and, and I think maybe this is a bigger conversation and I think we do need to have this conversation, right? We do need yeah. to talk about what laws are required in Canada, what the workplace safety, if this is going to go on and on, which I, you know, we keep saying, I hope it's going to be over and it's not, I, I think that some <laughs> countries and states and whatever know that they've got to adapt. So I think that some of that also requires Canadian data and that framing it that way that we need evidence related to workplaces is important. And, and I mean, this is not just a COVID uh, issue. This yeah. has been, you know, as yeah. long as I've been doing health and safety, it's been a, an issue. So, um, yeah. Anyway, uh, let's, I, I will bug you about this, but, uh, down the road, um, yeah. We both yeah, well, that's okay. And Dorothy, you know, right? If I don't see an email, don't reply because it <laughs> gets a little bit. Uh, if it's really important, come to a meeting, or you can get hold of Grace sometimes. Yeah. But yeah. as you know, sometimes things just flow through my inbox okay. like a river, and yeah. it's yeah. a bit random whether I see it or not. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, there was a question about I think long COVID and your uh, like how your oh. how your. I guess presenting that and, and 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 the I guess the level of consequence. Um, so I, I'm not sure if you covered that in the presentation. So I don't know if you want to. Yeah. So on the weekly report, which by the way, um, I know that so all of these data in our weekly report are fully downloadable. They're all open. It's we do this every week, and so anyone can. You just go to COVID nineteen resources Canada. And go to public resources and you can find our our data and um and um so and our weekly report is called uh i actually can't remember what we call it on our website but it's canadian COVID uh, data <laughs> index or something i think is, is that uh, yeah i think so and we have to change all that because we're not using the word hazard and anyway there's so much stuff to do that we haven't done but okay so we do long COVID estimates and uh, what we do, um, so um, we um, estimate the number of total daily infections in Canada um, based on um, what provinces look like compared to Quebec. And we know in Quebec roughly what those are because of the survey data. We also know that the, the, um, the estimated percentage, the, the prevalence in the population has been really similar to what is uh, reported in the UK with actual testing of samples from people. So, you know, we're, we know that it's, um, it's certainly within the, like, absolutely within the same pretty close ballpark. Um, okay, so based on that, um, so what we do is we take two pieces of information. So we take the StatsCan data, but, so StatsCan, the way they ask their question, they asked a question that's kind of similar to what the UK asks when they survey people about long-lasting symptoms, um, but they don't ask people to distinguish between whether they had those symptoms before they got COVID or after, whereas the UK does. So StatsCan's estimate is that 10.5% of people who've had um, COVID um, experience symptoms um, uh, experience symptoms that last for at least three months, at least one symptom. Um, and, but the problem is that we don't know, like the most common symptom is fatigue, but the prevalence of fatigue can be pretty high and is amazingly unknown as I think actually probably many of you know better than me, um, that it's unknown for many countries. So, so we think that this is high, um, I, um, and it doesn't, and there, it may be including people who had other, who had the symptoms before they had COVID because of ways stats can't ask the question, but we do have Canadian data. What we use are UK estimates, um, which are lower than this, but in the UK, we get information about um, 
uh, whether symptoms are severe enough to limit activities of daily life. And, um, and, and so in the UK, the percentage of people uh, during Omicron whose symptoms, who get an infection that la and it lasts, the symptoms last longer than 12 weeks and the activities of daily life are limited, is about 1.5% of total infections, not just first time infections. And so essentially we do these estimates of what the prevalence is, how many people are infected on any given, how many, sorry, reinfections or, or new infections are happening on any given day. And then we assume that 1.5% uh, of those are going to result in longer lasting symptoms that uh, limit activities of daily life. And then we adjust that just slightly by province. So we know, um, you know, we, the, it looks like the proportion or the amount of long COVID is roughly proportionate to your vaccination rates, the age of your population, because people who have some more severe illness are more, um, uh, are more likely um, to uh, develop long COVID. And so we use 1.5% for Canada, and then we just slightly adjust for each province based on what their estimated population infection fatality rate is relative to Canada. And that in turn is based on population age structure, vaccination rates, et cetera. Um, so this is how we estimate long COVID. And then we also have estimates in this weekly report. Um, we do, you know, estimates of prevalence. So, oh, sorry, some of the charts are broken. This is the other thing, the charts break and I'm like, oh, <laughs> I fix the charts. Okay. But hopefully, damn. Okay. So yet another thing I have to fix this week, but we basically, um, can we estimate about how many people in the population, the percentage of the population that are, are experiencing long lasting symptoms that also limit activities of daily life. Um, and then that plus the pe the percentage of people who are infected. And the idea of doing that is to have a sense of how much of the um, workforce, for example, might be affected um, and, um, and you know, how, um, yeah, like how that is affecting, um, yeah, the workforce or or the people, the number of people who are um, sort of currently um, incapacitated or have reduced capacity either because of a, an acute infection right now where they, they need to stay home or whatever, or they're feeling sick or because of long lasting symptoms. So we try to roughly estimate that um, to sort of get a sense of on any given day, how bad is this problem in Canada? And as you can imagine, the summer and fall, it was pretty awful. Um, it's better now, um, but you know, we'll see what happens. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think we should wrap it up, although there's been some sharing of really good uh, resources and comments. So I invite everyone to save the chat. We will also save the chat if anybody um, loses it and, and wants to come back and, and ask. Um, I do invite and, John actually and, and, um, and you Tara to give, you know, some, any final thoughts related to this is, you know, occupational yes. COVID where we are, where we're at right now, where yeah. we're heading in terms of spring and summer and, um, what, what, and what we can do to try and make a difference. What's that? Just before that, I actually wanted to ask as well, something yeah. that people in our sessions talk about a lot is um, fit testing of masks and how do we know that the fit works and everything. And I'm wondering if there's anyone here who A, could provide you know website resources or anyone who does fit testing, which I'm sure some of you do, and who might be interested in coming to one of our sessions to talk about how fit testing works and to provide expert insight into this. Um, I can only provide insight that's based on what I've read and my personal experience of being fit tested regularly. Um, but it would be really wonderful if there's anyone here who'd like to be part of one of our sessions and um, sort of act as our guest presenter about this topic, because it's a very common theme. And I appreciate that, thank you. Thanks. I don't know. John, do you have a, wanted to even answer that or? Um... Well, uh, I'm not sure if I'm 
I have done enough fit testing to uh, qualify, but I'll give you an a anecdote. Uh, the dentist where I go, um, they had masks and I started asking about them. And they said, uh, yes, we sent everybody out for qual quantitative fit testing and everybody failed except one. So then we sent them out for qualitative uh, fit testing and everybody passed. And uh, so if, if you're if you're talking about fit testing, be aware that uh, everybody's doing yeah. qualitative and it, it's, yeah. it's uh, not a very, but uh, as just a final um, observation, my fear, um, you know, in, in March of 2020, the province took away uh, N95s from healthcare workers and locked them up and said, you only need a, a, a mask. And as I said in my presentation, uh, two weeks ago, I was at a long-term care facility and I was asked to take a fit tested N99 off in order to put uh, a surgical mask on. And I'm afraid that all the experience we've had, um, people are so traumatized or I'm not sure if that's the right word, but uh, they, they so want to put this behind them that I'm, I'm afraid we're not going to learn anything from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I share the same fear about a lot of this. I know about you, about others. You're muted, Kevin. Just a suggestion about fit testing. Uh, we've actually got Roy McKay from the US to present, and there might be a recording somewhere in our archive. Yeah, I was just looking for that. Actually. Oh, okay. It might be useful yes. because he's the he's the guru from the states around fit testing. Yeah, you're going to get really good at yeah. that but from Roy. Yeah. We also have um, a number of videos uh, from this series or from our earlier series about masking and respiratory protection, and we also have some guidance uh, that uh, Kevin wrote about um, um, about respirators in the workplace, um, which mm -hmm. we can send you. And then I guess, but. Uh, our organization itself, although we advocate very strongly for quantitative and, and thorough fit testing, which would be quantitative, yeah. we don't have the, uh, we're not set up to actually do it. So we can give advice to on this, yeah. but, but we don't have the, um, um, yeah. you know, that's just not, we're, we don't have the equipment um, and nor enough yeah. staff to be able to op offer the service yeah. across the province. So. Um, but uh, but we probably could help you help find somebody that uh, could come and speak at your uh, one of your sessions and the well, aerosol transmission. Some of the, the CATC also has a number of members who have expertise yeah. in respirators, Simon Smith and others. So yeah. we could um, we could provide some of those links. So yeah, yeah. Yep. I was gonna say certainly it's something that his people have been wondering if they need to be concerned recently about the pressing um, respirators. Um, some of you may have seen um, a Twitter thread about it, but um, I, it's not clear that the, anyway, but it just, it's a common theme, right? Is how do we know that our masks are working as well as the best they can for us, so. Yeah, it's, it's tricky. And John has uh, advocated already now for a couple of years that it's a life skill yeah. nowadays and we all should, everybody in society should understand how to wear a respirator and get one fitted for their face. Um, but it is a, it is yeah. a challenge to even find a variety um, to be able to find one that fits your face and then to, yeah. um, to be able to be tested so you can be assured of it. There, there is a website, um, the, um, I'm not sure I can maybe find, um, that's the uh, mask charity that offers a set of, um, you can get a set of 20 different ones so you, as a way to try them. Yeah. Um, so they've created a variety pack as such um, that is a one way for people to, um, to get that. I just have to look for that. So um, yeah. I guess, John, did you have anything else to say aside from, aside from pessimism, which unfortunately, yeah, we're, the moral injury continues, I think. Um, don't oh, even ask. Yeah, that's right. Let me see if I can yeah, find the, the problem. Is it was... like the, the beatings will continue until morale improves? Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> if 
Well, after SARS-1, we had a Royal Commission, which had excellent uh, recommendations, uh, which the Ministry of Labor worked hard to implement and then gradually let go of. And uh, yeah. so we, all, everything that we learned, we kind of uh, frittered it away by the time this pandemic started. And uh, I, there's absolutely no appetite amongst any governments that I know for a royal commission on this to find out what went wrong, uh, because everybody's trying to ignore what went wrong. Yeah. So sorry, no, no positive. How about you, Tara? Any any, any uh, yeah last words in terms of? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that, like with many things, that there that there are sort of pendulum shifts sometimes, right? So, there was that. Uh, I, I think that we will we've swung so widely in one direction now that I think that. Um, some attitudes may um, may improve. I think if people sort of, uh, ironically, I think as people think about COVID less and deal with COVID less, that it's not going to be such a hot button topic for some people where they get, they're like, I don't want to hear about it. I'm sick of it. So I think that some of that process may eventually happen. Um, but I think as far as workplaces go, I think it's going to be one sort of lawsuit at a time. It's going to be, um, it's, I think it's just going to be a long slogging effort um, in every province individually with everyone trying to chip away and contribute one step at a time. But then, I mean, has most things have always been like that, right? Look at how long it took to get rid of smoking in public places or a myriad of other things that just took forever to do and and um so maybe i mean yes I, I don't think it's going away um i i uh there's not a lot of hope in some ways but we all know that that small efforts focused on changing one thing at a time cumulatively make a big difference and we're just not going to get big symbolic wins i don't think as much anymore i think we just have to settle down and just go put one foot after the other and and keep working with people talking to people taking care of each other but i kind of think we're just in a different phase now and that that and that uh there are no good gonna be no big saviors right we just gotta do the work um and keep going and and keep collaborating with other people yeah, it's more like the fight for smoking and uh, some of those other yeah. long asbestos, how many years it took yeah. to yes. get those recognized as a hazard and then get something done about right. it. And even still, we still fight that fight in, in places. So yeah. it's become like yeah, that. Exactly. Okay, thank you to everybody who stuck around and and to everyone who came and then especially the faithful who, who uh, stuck around and particularly Tara, for you to share your busy time with us and, and of course, all the work that you're doing. And you too, John, also extremely busy, um, but to come and uh, reflect on where we've been and how that, you know, in the context of trying to uh, literally, it's knowledge translation, trying to bring the knowledge about yeah. the hazards and about what can be done about it to people so that it can um, can make a difference in their daily lives and in their work. So we'll we'll keep going, as I yeah. say in the chat, that we have two more sessions in April um, on the 21st yeah. with Dr. Pickett and on the um, 28th with Nora Loretto and Dorothy, uh, which is also the day of mourning. Um, so I think that will be a really good session. And Tara, you have sessions coming up on Saturday or Tuesday, or what, what do yours look like? Oh, we always have them. Tuesdays we talk about data, Wednesday, or sorry, Thursday, is are just open for any COVID topic people want to cover. Saturdays, we tend to do some of our planning. So it's a whole bunch of us get together and check in on what we're doing, what needs to be done. But anyone can join. It's open. Um, so you can always find those by going to our websites, website and uh, looking up COVID discussions. And whatever's coming up is posted on Eventbrite. And anyone is welcome to drop in, drop out. Um, 
whatever you want. Uh, we're just, we're there and you can be anonymous and, you know, they're, uh, we just want to make sure people can be there comfortably together. And, and, and they're talk. also bilingual, I believe, right? Or... They are indeed. We, moi, je parle français, pas très bien. Et il y a des francophones qui, uh, qui sont là toujours aussi. So they're, they're bilingual. Great. Okay. Thanks very much and have a good weekend. And I hope the snow that you were getting is a uh, transient snow because spring really should be here. And so okay. it should be. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks everybody. Thank you. See you in a few weeks. It was weeks. wonderful to be here. Yeah. Bye. 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 to make sure I'm a host before I leave the meeting or else. Oh no, who else is here? Okay, I'm gonna leave and come back. It's the only way I can do it. Okay, thanks everyone. I'm going to turn the meeting off now. I had to come back in as host to get control. Take care. Stay healthy. Bye. 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 We can tune back in if you want. I'm going to save and live streaming. Thanks.